Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Today's lecture will cover the relationship between dental anatomy and periodontics, and will cover the following areas. A definition of periodontics, the aspects of the periodontium, periodontal disease, its etiology and diagnosis as they relate to the morphological aspects of the tooth, how periodontal instrumentation relates to tooth morphology and crown morphology, a review of tooth morphology and periodontics of the entire dentition in both the normal and in areas of developmental anomalies. Periodontics is that area of dentistry which is concerned with, support, with the supporting and surrounding tissues of the teeth and maintaining them in a state of health throughout the lifetime of the patient. The periodontium includes those aspects of the teeth that include the gingival tissues, the alveolar bone, a cementum on the root surface, and the periodontal ligament. Now a slide of the normal gingival tissues would look something like this. The color of the uh, gingival tissues is normally a pale pink. The form of the tissues is that the gingival margin ends in a knife edge around the necks of the teeth. The tissue is firm and dense, and there is little tendency for bleeding. Now, if we were to take a cross-section of a tooth, this side of the slide indicates the normal periodontium, and these are the aspects of the normal periodontium. This, of course, is the tooth, the surrounding alveolar bone, and the aspects of the periodontium are as follows, the gingival tissues, the surrounding or supporting alveolar bone, the periodontal ligament, and the cementum covering the root surface. These are the four components of the periodontium. Now, when periodontal disease begins, periodontal disease in its simplest form begins with inflammation in the gingival tissues. And this inflammation is caused by bacterial plaque. In this slide, I can show you bacterial plaque as seen in a patient's mouth. Bacterial plaque is a sticky, transparent material which adheres to the surface of the tooth. It is made up of approximately 95% bacteria. The products of these bacteria are responsible for causing inflammation in the gingival tissues and eventually the supporting bone. In this case, the plaque has been stained with the aid of a disclosing solution so that it may be more readily observed. The orange color indicates the presence of bacterial plaque on the surface of the tooth. Although plaque is the uh, principal etiologic agent in periodontal disease, calculus is also a significant factor. Calculus is made up principally of deposits of calcium and phosphate on the surface of the tooth. In this mirror picture of the lingual surface of the lower anteriors, just above the word calculus on your screen, there are heavy calcium deposits around the cervical aspect of these teeth. Calculus uh, deposits on the surface of the tooth, on the extracted teeth that you have, may appear either as a dark area or as light, flaky material. Much of the uh, lighter material gets chipped off uh, in the sorting process of the teeth, but some of the darker material will remain. This is not part of normal morphology of the tooth surface. Now, since we've discussed the etiologic, the principal etiologic factors concerned with periodontal disease, now let me proceed to a mouth to show you gingival inflammation resulting from deposits of both plaque and calculus. In this slide here, you can see that the gingival tissues are rolled. They, put, they are very puffy. 
there is a marked uh, tendency to bleed of these tissues. And generally, there are heavy accumulations of both plaque and calculus. Now, admittedly, this is a rather severe case of marginal gingivitis or inflammation of the gingival tissues. But left untended, this condition may result eventually in the loss of teeth. The statistics uh, point out to us that uh, one out of 10 people in the age group between 35 and 45 have lost all of their teeth. By the time we move to the age group between 55 and 64, three out of 10 have lost all of their teeth. And nearly half of those individuals, 65 and over, have lost all of their teeth. Let me now demonstrate uh, by using a graphic exactly the progress of periodontal disease. In the section here, we notice that there are accumulations of both plaque and calculus on the surface of the tooth. There is slight gingival inflammation, but in the initial stages, there is no bone breakdown. The surrounding and supporting alveolar bone surrounds the tooth in its normal anatomical position. Now, as the disease progresses, we notice that the accumulations of plaque and calculus proceed on down the root surface, causing inflammation in the tissues and also beginning loss of the attachment between the gum tissue and the tooth so that one of two things happens. Either the gingival tissues recede on the tooth from their normal position or the gingival tissues stay in essentially the same place and the depth of the gingival sulcus proceeds down the tooth and becomes what is known as a periodontal pocket. Now left untended, the disease will continue to progress until the bone support of the tooth becomes more undermined, the teeth become loose, they begin to drift apart, and eventually, in the end, teeth are lost if periodontal disease is not treated. Now in the following mouth, let me show you the results of advanced periodontal disease. In this mouth, there have been loss of teeth, drifting teeth, severe amount of gingival inflammation, pus formation, and it will result in the eventual loss of the dentition if periodontal disease is not diagnosed and treated. Now let me demonstrate for you the significance of variations in crown and root surface morphology as they affect diagnostic procedures used in periodontics. On this illustration, we note how the protective contour of the crown influences the shape of the gingival margin. The gingival margin is the area of the gingiva which contacts the surface of the tooth in this area. Where the protective contour uh, goes along like this, you'll notice that the gingiva ends in what we call a knife edge. Now, when the gingiva has receded on the surface of the tooth, and the protective contours are absent, many times the gingival contour is rolled. With the aid of this illustration, let me demonstrate to you the significance of the cemento enamel junction as it relates to diagnostic procedures used in periodontics. Ordinarily, if gingival tissues are reasonably healthy and there is a small amount of marginal inflammation, the gingival tissues attach to the surface of the tooth and in the area of the cemento enamel junction. Where periodontal disease has progressed and bone loss has occurred, the gingival tissues may recede, or the gingival tissues, as we pointed out before, may stay in the same place on the tooth. If this happens, a periodontal pocket is formed. And this indicates the depth of the periodontal pocket. The cemento enamel junction is used as a reference point to determine the extent of the apical migration of the attachment on the surface of the tooth. Now let me show you on a number of extracted teeth how the contours of the cemento enamel junction change as we move from mesial to distal. Around this tooth here, which is a maxillary central incisor, the cemento enamel junction is quite distinct. 
generally as we move from anterior to posterior, then the contours of the cemental enamel junction are reduced. And let's just pan down these teeth here. And we can see that as we move from anterior to posterior, the contour of the cemental enamel junction is less and less. Contours generally are more contoured in the maxillary arch than in the mandibular arch. You notice the contrast between the maxillary central incisor and this mandibular central incisor. This has a very flat cemento enamel junction. And the same is true as we pan again from anterior to posterior. Now going back on these teeth again, we also notice that the shape of the cervical line changes as we move from anterior to posterior. Cervical line is very marked around central incisors, becomes less marked as we move back into the area of the premolars, and is even less marked as we moved into the molar region. The same is true of the mandibular teeth. Cervical line being more pronounced and curved interproximally than it is on the buccal and lingual of the teeth but again flattening as we move from anterior to premolar to the molar teeth. Now the instrument used for determination of the position of the cervical line is the periodontal probe. The periodontal probe is a thin tapered instrument and it has millimeter markings on the probe at three, six, nine, and 12 millimeters. Each of those divisions indicates three millimeters. Now in determining the position of the cemento enamel junction, the, let me take this tooth out of the type of here to demonstrate for you. The periodontal probe is held at an angle of approximately 45 degrees to the surface of the tooth. In teeth with distinct contours, the area of the cemento enamel junction is easier to determine than it is in teeth where the contours at the cemento enamel junction are slightly flatter. Now, let me show by putting the tooth back in the typodon again how this procedure would be done in the mouth. You now will begin to realize that most of what we do in periodontics is below the level of the free gingival margin. The periodontal probe is positioned at an angle of approximately 45 degrees to the surface of the tooth again and is placed to explore for the position of the cemento enamel junction. In a clinical situation, measurements would be made on the labial surface of the tooth and on the distal and on the mesial. Now, in addition to uh, knowing the shape and form of the cemento enamel junction in the cervical line, it is important to realize how the shapes of the roots influence the placement of the periodontal probe when exploring for periodontal pockets. Again, on an extracted tooth here, if you'll notice on this central, the root tapers as we move apically. Now, knowing this, when we're exploring for the depth of a periodontal pocket, the tip of the periodontal probe should be angled against the surface of the tooth. If it's angled against the surface of the tooth, it will not gouge out into the soft tissue, such as would happen if we were angling it out in this angle like so. Now, the tip of the probe must be inserted so it slides down the surface of the root. Let me put the tooth again back in the type of knot and demonstrate this to you. For instance, if we had a patient that had um, apical migration of the attachment and uh, bone loss around the central incisor, it's conceivable that uh, instead of the ordinarily three millimeter measurement, which would indicate the uh, distance between the free gingival margin here and the cemento enamel junction, we might measure as much as six millimeters. Um, and again, the, the periodontal probe being placed against the surface of the root would slide down into the periodontal pocket to record our six millimeter measurement. In addition to the uh, morphology or the shape of the roots uh, being significant uh, for the measurement of 
of periodontal pockets and the position of the cement enamel junction. Teeth, uh, as we see here, with either tapered roots or broad roots, have varying amounts of periodontal support. For example, if this position of the explorer of the periodontal probe here indicated the level of bone, if we were to lose proportionally the same amount of bone around both of these teeth, you can see how the tooth with the tapered root will lose proportionally more bone. This means that a conical shaped root, uh, the periodontal support of the conical shaped root will be undermined far more than a tooth with a broad flat root. In addition to the uh, variations of tapered and broad flat roots uh, influencing periodontal support and diagnosis in periodontal disease, teeth of comparable position have different lengths of their roots. Now obviously a lower incisor tooth with a short tapered root will have less bone support and will be affected more by incipient bone loss than a tooth with a long root. Many patients with advanced periodontal disease may have lost bone down to the extent where furcations on upper and lower molar teeth have been involved. Let me just take this lower molar tooth out of the typodont. Ordinarily, if we have a normal amount of supporting bone around a tooth such as this, bone will surround the tooth up to a level about this far. Now, when you begin to lose bone around the tooth, eventually we get down to the point where we've lost enough supporting bone so that it has exposed the furcation area on the tooth. You may be able to see this using a dental x-ray machine and a radiograph. This is a picture of bone loss proceeding to the extent where it has exposed the lower furcation on that molar. In addition to using radiographs for diagnosis of these types of periodontal defects, the Cowhorn Explorer is also used. The Explorer is manipulated in such a way as to enter the furcation area on the buccal and lingual of mandibular molars, and in maxillary molars on the buccal, the mesial lingual, and the distal lingual. Now let me place the tooth back again in, in the typodont and demonstrate to you how this would be done in a clinical situation. The explorer is inserted between the gingival tissues and the tooth and moved down to the area between the root surfaces. Now much of this diagnostic information is recorded on what we call a periodontal chart, a portion of which is represented here. On the periodontal chart, Measurements are made measuring the relationship between the free gingival margin, which was represented by this line here, and the cemento enamel junction, which is represented here, and here, and here. Measurements are also made of pocket depths, which are recorded at three places on the buccal and three places on the lingual of the teeth, represented as four millimeters, five millimeters, and four millimeters. There is a representation made of whether furcations are exposed, as we had just discussed, whether teeth have drifted apart, and whether there is food impaction. In addition to that, mobility of the teeth is also recorded in the blanks here. This enables the operator to take such diagnostic information and use it at a glance when treatment planning for the treatment of periodontal disease. It is the dentist's responsibility when treating periodontal disease to smooth the surfaces of the roots and to remove adherent bacterial plaque. It's also the dentist's responsibility to educate the patient to the point where he understands what he needs to do at home to remove bacterial plaque. To remove the hard deposits from the surface of the tooth and to smooth the surfaces of the roots, various kinds of instruments are used. These are called scalers. The uh, scalers um, are made of stainless steel. They have a sharp edge on them. If we can get in a little bit tighter here, I can show that, okay. 
Now, the uh, edge that's used to scale the surface of the tooth is the outside edge and the inside edge of this instrument. This is called a curette. Now let me also pick up a jacquette scaler, or a sickle scaler. Later on in your studies, you'll have more of an introduction to the types and designs of scalers. But this instrument, again, also has sharp cutting edges both on the inside and the outside. Now, in addition to the scalers, there are also instruments that are called hoes. Hoe is also designed to remove calculus from the surface of the root. It's designed so that this is the cutting edge of the instrument and is applied against the surface of the tooth to remove calculus. In addition to hose, where deposits are adherent and root surface roughness is prevalent, files are used. A file, again, is used to smooth the surface of the root. In here are tiny little serrations, which are used to file the surface of each one of those roots. Now let me demonstrate for you on an extracted tooth how these scalers would be used and some of the anatomical considerations significant to their use. For instance, if we take a um, mesial surface of a maxillary premolar tooth, we notice that the, the mesial surface of this tooth has a mesial root surface concavity. Now, if a scalar is placed against this mesial root surface, the shape of the scalar must conform to the shape of the root surface. Now, if we have a flat scalar and a curved root surface, understandably, we must take the scalar and move it around the surface of that root so that we clean the area of the mesial concavity and clean the irregularities involved at the sminoenamel junction. If the scalar is manipulated just straight away this way, we will miss calculus that adheres in the area of the sminoenamel junction and also root surface roughness. By angling the scalar, we can clean in these areas. Now, it's important to realize that uh, there are other teeth that uh, may have furcation involvements. Uh, if there is a furcation involvement, scalars, um, it's important to know the anatomy of that area so that the scalar can be placed to clean into the furcation area. Now, this is just fine if we've got the teeth out here uh, on the bench uh, looking at them, but we must uh, remember, of course, that these teeth are not out in your hand. They're in a patient's mouth. And uh, most of the areas that you'll be scaling, you'll be scaling just by touch or feel. The explorer is used to determine the position of root surface roughness on the surface of the tooth and is manipulated like so. And after using the fine explorer to determine the presence or absence of calculus, we then go back with a curette, place it subgingivally, and scale in those areas. Now, a thorough knowledge of root surface shape and morphology is essential to do an adequate job of scaling. In addition to the uh, difficulties encountered in uh, scaling the teeth or removing deposits from them, it is also, um, there are some difficulties associated with the closeness of teeth as far as the access, uh, their access to polishing. Now, this device here is a, is a rubber cup, and uh, this rubber cup is uh, used by a dentist uh, along with some prophylaxis paste to polish your teeth. Now, if you look at the way the rubber cup contacts the tooth, you can see that basically the rubber cup only contacts the buccal surface of the tooth and the lingual surface of the tooth. But it cannot move very far interproximally. And let me demonstrate that to you again by removing this tooth. And 
Now you can see that when we place the rubber cup against the buccal surface of that tooth, there is the entire interproximal area that still remains unpolished. In order to polish the interproximal area of a tooth, dental floss is the method of choice. It's important to remember that most teeth tend to taper slightly from buccal to lingual. On this maxillary first premolar, you'll see that it has a broader mesial distal width on the buccal than it does on the lingual. The same thing is true of the second premolar. In order to clean effectively in these areas, one should take uh, the dental floss and make sure that in addition to just coming in between the teeth like this, that you have wrapped it around the lingual aspect of that tooth and around the lingual aspect of this tooth. The same applies to the significance between the shape of the crown and the uh, effectiveness uh, of toothbrushing. In other words, as an example, if we have a crown that has a heavy cervical contour to it in this area. In other words, if this area is, is very bulged out, then it may be difficult for a patient to adequately clean at the pregingival margin, the area where the gum surrounds the tooth. And just to demonstrate that, let me uh, use a toothbrush with the press roll method that was used uh, by many, still is. Let me see if we can come in like this. Now, if I lay that toothbrush up here and we have much contour on either the gingival tissues or on the buccal surface of the crown, the bristles will not clean in that narrow area at the junction of the tooth and the gum. Instead of using techniques such as this press roll technique, we have altered our techniques, altered the shape and the texture of brushes to much softer brushes. We've taken the brushes and moved them in at an angle like this, moving them back and forth. You can see how even with a fair amount of contour, either natural contour or contour caused by restorations, it's possible to clean down here at the cervical one-third of the tooth. Now, in addition to the, just the mechanical uh, difficulties of, of scaling and uh, removing plaque from the surface of the tooth, a uh, tooth may have a, just a natural amount of root surface roughness. The, uh, on this tooth, again, uh, this is calculus, the dark area, and when scaling on the surface of a crown, uh, calculus uh, can be fractured off uh, quite cleanly. And, uh, but when we get further on down on the root surface, then just the natural root surface roughness tends to act as a lock or a wedge for some of the calculus, making it more difficult to remove. In addition to um, the calculus uh, causing root surface roughness and aiding the retention of plaque in those areas, you may also find that uh, the inherent root surface roughness also causes a problem. Therefore, in addition to scaling, we do a procedure in periodontics called root planning. Root planning is nothing but taking a scaler and gradually working over the surface of the root to smooth that surface. Now, let me review for you the anatomical considerations that are significant when dealing with a periodontal patient. We are concerned principally with uh, treating the cervical one-third and the middle one-third of a root surface when dealing with a periodontal patient. If bone loss has proceeded to the point where it has involved the apical one-third of the root, periodontal prognosis is very poor. Here I've lined up the maxillary and mandibular teeth in anatomical position to review for you once again the changes in the contour of the seminoenamel junction and the cervical line as you move from mesial to distal. This is the mesial surface of the maxillary incisor tooth. And you'll notice that there is a marked curvature of, this, of the cervical line and a marked curvature of the seminoenamel junction. Now, as we pan across here and move from mesial to distal, Looking at the mesial aspect of these teeth, you'll notice that the cervical line tends to flatten. 
and the curvature of the cemento enamel junction becomes less pronounced. The same is true in the mandibular situation. In the mandibular central incisor, there's a marked curvature of the cervical line, and at least on the lingual, a marked curvature of the cemento enamel junction. As we proceed from mesial to distal, cervical line again flattens on these teeth, and the cemento enamel junction is less distinct. Now let me turn this around and we'll examine the distal surface of these teeth. Beginning with the maxillary central incisor, you can again see a marked curvature of the cemento enamel junction. It is less as we move to the around the areas of the premolars. And again, as we saw, the curvature of the cemento enamel junction is less, moving from mesial to distal. On the distal aspect of the lower central incisor, there is again a marked curvature of the cervical line, which flattens again as we move from mesial to distal. The same is true on the buccal aspect of the maxillary and mandibular teeth. Starting here on the maxillary central incisor, see that there is a marked buccal curvature. Turn these a bit, of the cervical line, which tends to flatten as you move from the incisors to the premolars and on down to the molars. The same is true in the mandibular situation. Again, a marked curvature in the anterior. And less curvature as we proceed from mesial to distal on the buccal. Let me turn these around. We'll show you the lingual aspect of these teeth. Starting with the lingual aspect of the maxillary central incisor, there is a marked curvature, and this is an excellent uh, view to show you how the teeth tend to taper from buccal to lingual, being narrower on their lingual aspect. The curvature of the cervical line again flattens as we move from mesial to distal. Now in the areas of the mandibular central incisors, again, there's a fairly marked curvature of the cervical line, which flattens in the premolar region, and flattens even more as we reach the molar region. There are certain teeth which have more pronounced root surface concavities. Let me demonstrate some of these for you. There is uh, generally more of a marked uh, root surface concavity on the distal surface of maxillary and mandibular incisor teeth. And uh, the concavity usually is deeper as we move from the incisor tooth to the cuspid. This is a central incisor. So we move from the central to the lateral. See there's a slight increase in the concavity. Then as I move from the lateral to the cuspid, concavity is even slightly more marked in the cuspid. In addition to that, concavities are prominent in the mesial surface of maxillary first premolar. Particularly in this area here. And concavities may be prominent in the mesial root surface of a mandibular molar. 
This is an extracted tooth and doesn't show quite as well, but uh, the concavity is located in this area of the root. Concavities are also prominent on the palatal root of maxillary first molars. You can see a marked concavity in this area of the root surface. As we mentioned before, uh, furcation areas become significant uh, in uh, maxillary and mandibular, particularly first and second molars. Many times as we proceed to a third molar tooth, instead of seeing a widely furcated root, we will have a tendency for fused roots. Now, teeth with uh, long, broad roots, such as cuspids and maxillary and mandibular molars, offer more periodontal support and therefore resist forces of occlusion considerably better than short, tapered roots. Now, one last comment about some anatomical variations between teeth. Many times uh, you will have teeth that are affected by wear and tear, such as cervical abrasion on the tooth. Cervical abrasion on the tooth, I can best demonstrate in this manner. This is a uh, maxillary molar tooth. The uh, tooth has been worked over with a hard toothbrush moving in a back and forth motion over a long period of time. And you can see that instead of the normal anatomy at the cemento enamel junction, that what we see here is a line of abrasion. Many times uh, patients will come in and they'll say, I think I've got something the matter. I can stick my thumbnail over the edge of this tooth and catch a very sensitive spot. Well, this is the kind of thing that causes that sensitivity. And it's called toothbrush abrasion or cervical abrasion of the tooth. Obviously, this is a marked case of cervical abrasion. In addition to um, wear and tear on the teeth, uh, some teeth are formed with what we call enamel extensions. And enamel extensions are nothing but formations of enamel, which sometimes tend to project on maxillary and mandibular molars down into the area of the furcation. On this tooth here, you can see that there is a slight enamel extension, which changes the shape of the cervical line from being broad and flat across here, and it projects down into the area of the furcation. Some teeth will have enamel extensions that uh, proceed all the way down into the furcation area itself. One final word, there are sometimes teeth uh, that have what we call enamel pearls on them. This is a block here of uh, extracted teeth. These are all maxillary molars. Let me turn it over here to orient you. On these molar teeth, you can see this slight little dot here indicates the presence of an enamel pearl. These are just aberrant formations of enamel that form principally in the furcation areas of maxillary molars. In conclusion, I hope that uh, today's lecture has been able to demonstrate to you the significance and the relationship between periodontal diagnosis and treatment and the dental anatomy of the teeth. The information contained in this lecture will be useful in the courses that you'll have in your future experience in periodontics, and I hope aid you in establishing a rewarding career in dentistry. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.